We're going to look now at uh, God's Word and the reading this morning. Uh, you should see on the screen behind me from 1 John chapter 3, starting at verse 1. How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and my sisters. If the world hates you, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Amen. Well read, Helen. That's a long, a long passage. And um, I'm sitting there realizing that everyone here is probably thinking Chris is really intelligent. He does his planning exceptionally well. Well, because how great is the love the Father has lavished on us. And of course, today is Father's Day. And you might have thought, well, he's deliberately planned it this way. Well, I'm afraid I'm not that intelligent. It's the way it's dropped out. But I know a man who is. Hallelujah. And by his spirit, I believe that God really wants to say something to us. And uh, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us and how important fathers are. And, and Jason, in his testimony, talked a little bit about his father, how his father has had an encounter with Jesus and, and has had a change of heart and, and has fallen in love with Jesus. And it was seen and it was visible. And there was an impact on the father's son, on 
Jason and, and how, how powerful is the love of God that, that, that God's son in human form, God in human form, uh, perfect man and, and perfect God, how the son of God, Jesus, died on the cross and, and witnesses to the love of the Father that has an impact on you and me. Well, I do hope that you are enjoying the sermon series on the little book of 1 John. And I hope that you've been reading this book, 1 John, for yourselves. It is a very powerful book about who we are in Christ, and it has very practical living. It is a challenging book, and I hope you've taken up the challenge to put its recommendations into practice. As I have said many times, the Bible is a book that tells the truth, and truth divides, and it can feel and it can be quite sharp. And uh, this passage actually is quite sharp. And when you really sit and read it and meditate it and get behind what is being said, it is sharp and it does divide. I don't know if you picked up on some of the phrases, phrases like children of God, contrasted with children of the devil. Do what is righteous, contrasted with he who does what is sinful is of the devil. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Sin is lawlessness. And there's a warning to the Christian. Dear children, do not lay, let anyone lead you astray. These are powerful, powerful short sentences. And surely they impact upon us as we read them and we think through them. So this chapter, chapter 3, challenges us to walk as children of God and to resist the devil and those of the devil so that we do not fall. John begins this chapter by stating our identity that is in Christ. We are called children of God. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And as if we didn't know that, John wants to say, and that is what we are. If you know and love Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then you are a child of God. Hallelujah. Your identity is in the family of God as his son, meaning inheritor, his daughter, meaning all of us, male or female, boy or girl. If you know Jesus, then our identity is a child of God. And last time I mentioned in a sermon, we are citizens of heaven. We are not citizens of earth. Our identity and our destiny have changed, not because of anything we've done. Do you know, does, our heart breaks when, when people pick up from the gospel that we have to earn our salvation. And Jason actually learned that lesson quite young. It's a good lesson to learn. It is by faith through the grace of God that we are saved. Not that we can earn it. Otherwise, we'll be boastful people. Look at me. I'm better than you are. But it is not a free gift. It demands our souls. It demands our lives. It demands our very being. But when we are in Christ, the love of God is unconditional. Hallelujah. Because we become his children. So our destiny and our identity has changed the moment we believed in Christ and accepted his sacrifice. And then God lavishes his love on us. He pours out his love. It's overflowing like a waterfall. And that's because we know his son, Jesus Christ. Amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. My chains fell off the moment I believed. And we've been singing some of these songs this morning. And here in this passage, when you go back and you look at it, John contrasts us, the children of God, the believer, with the world, the unbeliever. The world does not know us because it does not know Christ. It's very hard-hitting and it's very straightforward. It's really easy to understand. We are changed people. We are 
different people. Our home is not this world. Our home is the eternal city that we look towards. We are a forgiven, set-apart people in the kingdom of God. And once we were in the world, once we were like all the others, once we were lost in our sin, and John describes the world as being children of the devil, that is hard-hitting, is it not? And yet that's how we started. So we are not to despise the people of the world. As Jesus loves the world, we are to love our brothers and sisters, our human, fellow human beings. And because we have experienced such a great forgiveness, and because we know of where we were going, we know of what we were outside of Christ, the message we preach is come to Christ. He's the way, the truth, the life. He's the only way to know God. Hallelujah. And Jason has been telling his friends at school this message. And when Jason gets baptized, he's saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of salvation to me because I have believed in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So once we were in the world, once we were rebellious, once we were living in lawlessness. Have you ever seen yourself as lawless? We started that way. But now we are in Christ. We have become children of God. And he is our heavenly father. And for that, and for that reason alone, that we are in Christ, God pours out his love upon us because we become the children of God loved by the Father in the way that the Father loves the Son. Hallelujah and amen. And John tells us an amazing truth in a wonderful statement that applies only to us, to the Christian. And it is this, that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, the glorious risen Christ in his glorified eternal body, shining bright. And we will have the same. We will be like Christ in our own resurrected glorious bodies, sinless and incorruptible. We will be fit for eternal life, a forgiven people. All will rise from the grave. All will receive an eternal body. But not all will be children of God in the right destiny with God as our Father. And in a way, Jesus as our brother. Hallelujah. We become part of the family. The challenge really to us is to let our future really sink in. We will be like Christ. You and I will be like Christ. Do you think you can say that to your friend? Someone sitting next to you, turn and say, we will be like Christ. <laughs> Try saying that with conviction. We will be like Christ. You will be like Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. And we must allow this truth to penetrate our very being, to believe it. And when we do, when we know our position, our true identity in the Lord Jesus Christ, when we know what we are forgiven of, when we know what we are saved of, when we know what our destiny is, it should produce in us such an amazing love for our Savior that we will give him everything we have. We will give him all that we are, all our hopes and our dreams, all of our finances no. he doesn't ask for all of our finances he doesn't ask for all of our finances so we must allow this new identity to penetrate and then that should lead us into a place and a position a desire a want not to sin not to be like the world to strive to be holy as God is holy and Jesus appeared to take away our sins so that we can be separated from them and have the hope of living a holy life. When you get saved, we become changed instantly spiritually. But then we have to work out our salvation with some work and some fear and some trembling. We are not, we are not um, changed to the extent that we don't fall or we're not tempted. But we are changed to the extent that we can look out for it and we can do something about it. We do not need to live the way we used to. The result of our love for God because of his love for us in Christ is 
Well, the Bible says it, we will stop sinning. We will stop sinning. That's a challenge in itself. For me, we want to live differently. We want to please God. We want to put to death the sins that lead to death. We start to think differently. We start to act differently. We are motivated to change our wrong lifestyles and to be holy as God is holy. And we should want to do this all the days of our lives. We are being changed from glory to glory as we walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of us have walked this path for a long time. Many of us have been honed and have been polished. But we are not completely finished. We are all works in progress. But what John says is when that moment comes, when we pass through the valley of death or are changed and taken up, we will be like him. We will be glorious. We will be sinless. He who had no sin. We will be fit for purpose for the eternal kingdom. We've heard in an earlier sermon in this same little book that if we do sin, we have an advocate in heaven. We have a lawyer in heaven, Jesus Christ, who prays for us. And he forgives us our sin when we confess our sin and repent of it. There's always a new day with God. There's always a new start with God. If you feel that you are lost or you've been caught out or if you've recently fall, fallen, you have a lawyer, Jesus. He intercedes for you. Just turn to him. Give it to him. Confess it. Repent of it. Get up and change it. Hallelujah. John tells us another truth that the one born of God has the seed of God in him. Did you pick up on that? That's a sermon in its own right. There are 10 sermons in John chapter 3. I'm trying to give a bit of an overview in the context. John tells us that when we become a born again Christian, we have the seed of God in him. The deposit of the Holy Spirit dwelling and living in us. We have the DNA of God here in our hearts, walking with us, talking to us. He's our guide. He's our counselor. He's our sharp conscience so that our desire is not to sin and our action is to stop sinning. The devil has done a job. The devil is working to deceive and to steal people away from Jesus to keep them lost in their sin. And as soon as a person becomes a Christian, then the real trouble can start. Because now you're on Jesus' side, you're dangerous to the devil's kingdom. And so many of us as Christians, we go through the, the sufferings and the persecutions that come just because we're a Christian. Just because we want to follow Jesus. The evil one wants us to fall. The evil one wants to take away our power. He wants to strip us of everything. And he wants to steal salvation from us if that were possible. So John tells us that we have the DNA of God within us. And John describes the devil as the one who's been sinning from the very beginning. And those who do what is sinful are of the devil. And then we have the great statement from John. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. What is the devil's work? It's to blindside people. It's to take people to hell. To drag them with himself by any means into his own depraved destiny. But Jesus came to save those who would believe. So that the destiny could change and that we who believe become children of God. Hallelujah. Gospel's pretty straight and pretty simple. The only way to know God as Father is through the sacrifice of Jesus. I believe this is what John is saying. But then having become children of God, we now face the challenge. The challenge of being a child of God. And the challenge that keeps coming up in Scripture is to love one another. When I became a Christian, I believed that everyone had the same salvation I had, which they did, eternal life. I believe that everyone believed the doctrines that I believed. They didn't. They were different. I believe that uh, we all had the same hope and heart and, and, and dreams, but we were all in different phases, and therefore we weren't all the same. And then I suddenly realized, my goodness, it's hard to love my brother. It's actually hard to love my fellow Christian. Who is my fellow Christian? And, and John here gives us 
this challenge that we are to love one another. And John says that our, our new position in Christ is to put Christ into practice in our life and to love and have unity in the body. This is what he goes on to tell us. That aim is not always possible, but we are to work at it. We are to strive at maintaining peace in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so John takes us back, doesn't he, to two brothers right at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis. One who was righteous, one who was not. One who was after God and one who was of the devil. Yes, it's the story of Cain and Abel. It's the first recorded murder in the Bible, and that's between blood brothers. That's between true brothers. Blood from the same family, the same parents, Adam and Eve. And John says, do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. The answer to why Cain murdered Abel is here in this chapter. John says it sharp and straight. My great friend Trevor, who preached last week, he uh, puts it this way. He calls a spade a JCB. Have you heard that phrase? It's a northern phrase. A spade is a big, huge JBC. And, that, and John is like that. It's, it's really hard hitting. And he says that Cain's actions were evil. He was of the devil and his brother's actions were righteous. Do you know, there is something about people not liking righteousness and righteous people. There's something about the world that, that does not like a holy lifestyle. And uh, there's perhaps something a bit about us, if we're honest, that when we see a holy and righteous lifestyle happening before us, as, as soon as something starts to fall or a mistake is made, we can jump on it with criticism. We can jump on it with a tearing down of a person's character. And as Christians, we are not to do that. We can debate the doctrines, we can debate the differences, and we can debate the truths, but we should not be attacking or tearing down a person's character. And sometimes that's not always easy to do. In British politics, it's horrendous, isn't it? In the House of Commons, they're just tearing each other's characters down. Have you ever watched it? Oh, no, maybe not. You're much wiser than I am. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, we can have a self-righteousness that makes us feel good, you know, because I'm righteous. But as soon as someone falls, we, we can attack the person's character, and we're not to do that. John says, do not, he says this to Christians, do not be like Cain, who thought he was pleasing God when he offered a grain sacrifice. But Cain was disappointed, he was jealous and murderous when God rejected his offering and accepted Abel's blood sacrifice of an unblemished lamb. Cain did not know or had forgotten that we can only approach God who is holy through blood, especially through the blood of Jesus Christ. There, without blood, there is, there, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Abel knew this. His, his heart was after God. Abel had a sober look at who he was and gave the appropriate sacrifice. We should not be surprised if the world hates us. We stand for righteous living, not just please ourselves. And John challenges us this way, and he ups the stakes. In verse 15, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Wow. So it's not the act, it's the motive. And Jesus did that so often himself, didn't he? He actually uses very sharp things to bring home to us how Christians are supposed to live. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. As far as God is concerned, the attitude of murder is murder. Whew. That's painful. That's a challenge. And as I've said in this sermon series before, we do not have to like our brothers or sisters. We do not have to like their lifestyles. But if they are a Christian, we are to love them. We are to draw alongside them. Out of love, we are seeking the best benefit for them. And sometimes we might have to speak with some tough love truths. But always remember, when you speak to a person Three fingers are pointing back at ourselves. So we need to check our own selves first. But when we become a Christian, we are supposed to have, and we can have, the mind, the attitude, and the love of Christ for our brothers and sisters in Christ. That means, as Christ did for us, we may be called to lay down 
our own lives for our brother or our sister. It might be that we are falsely accused, but we keep quiet. We don't run to defend ourselves. It might look that somebody hates us or verbally abuses us, but we still act with graciousness and mercy and forgiveness. Church is not easy. I'm not easy. If I get caught up in a big debate, stuff comes out of my mouth that can be sharp and hurtful. I may or may not intend it, but it can happen. There is a cost to being a Christian and somewhere in all of our lives, we have to sacrifice ourselves for our brother or for our sister. As a new Christian coming towards a close, I bought a mini, I bought a car from a man in the church. I'd been saved maybe two months. I, I, I wanted a car, he had a car. It was a nice car, it was a small blue mini and I bought it from him. But I didn't know that much about cars. I wondered why an orange light was on on the dashboard. I put water in the right place, I'd worked that out, but the orange light did not go out. And I was driving down the M4 at 60 miles an hour and the engine ceased. Why? Because the light said, put oil in me. And I never put the oil in the car. I became ashamed, I became embarrassed, I became defensive and I, I went back to church said, that car you gave me is blown up on me. Never told him about the orange light. And his response was a struggle. It was a struggle and I could see his struggle. But what he said was, that's okay, Chris. I will take the car back and here's your money. He had gone to a very good pastor and the pastor had said to him, Chris has just come out of the world. He's still thinking like the world. He's still acting a bit like the world. He's just been saved. Do not put a stumbling block in the way of Chris. And I want to publicly thank that man I can't remember his name, but his act of love and mercy, knowing what I had done, knowing the truth about the engine, that I hadn't put oil in it, he let me off. He gave my money back, and he showed a powerful Christianity to me that helped me along my way. Well done to that man. And then finally, in the practical outworking of being children of God and being called to love one another, in the kingdom family, concerns supporting one another in love. I mean, we are trying to support people less fortunate than ourselves, and we do an awful lot with food banks, we do a lot sending them out to the needy. But there are needy people in the church, and we as Christians need to find the needy people in the church. And there are needy people in every single church, in body, soul, and spirit, maybe financially, maybe even with food. And we need to be aware of one another in the body. And we are to put our Christianity into action, not into nice flowery words or a heightened spirituality, but if anyone is in need, a brother and a sister, we should seek to meet the need. I'm very pleased that uh, at this church, we have an emergency fund that the church gives, a discretionary fund that when people are in real trouble, there is, there is a discretionary fund that can be used immediately to help people along the way. And we do that for our brothers and sisters. But there might be someone that you know who's in need, somebody who needs something or, or anything that's happening in their lives. Then, don't just know it and don't just look at them. <laughs> The Bible says that sometimes the prodding of the Holy Spirit, there was a lot about if our hearts condemn us, there's, there's something about the prodding of God in our inner person. If we know of somebody and our hearts are rising, then maybe we need to do something about it. If we see someone in need and we think and feel, ouch, I really should do something, then do it. Just do it. 
Don't wake up the next morning regretting that you didn't do it. So my conclusion to this sermon is, read John, 1 John 3 and just do it. Just put into practice everything that he tells us to do. But in closing, John started this chapter with who we are in Christ. He contrasts true believers from false believers and the world. He challenges us to stay safe in the faith, to stop sinning, to start loving and putting it all into action. And then John ends this chapter with a good description of a child of God. If our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence in God and in that position we can receive from God. We will obey his commands and do what pleases him. Remember, Jesus said, if you love me, you will do what I say. And John gives us God's command and it's not an option, it's a vital necessity to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he has commanded us. And therefore to all Christians who obey his commands and who live like this, God is in us and we are in him. And the Holy Spirit witnesses with our spirits that yes, we are children of God. And God is our Father. Hallelujah. So Saul Church, read chapter three and just do it. Amen.